am sitting in the Sheraton Hotel at Chantegal Airport, just on the edge of Paris, with Professor Craig Simons. And that's very exciting because I'm a big fan, Craig. Oh, and, thank you, James. Um, and um, I've read several of your books. And the one I'm particularly keen to talk to you about is Midway. Right. Because it's this big, pivotal battle that really turns the tide, I think, in the... War well, in the is. Pacific. It's, you know, in, in a way, for an English audience, I think the one way to understand this, it's the American Trafalgar. Right. Right? I mean, because the, the enemy fleet was annihilated in a spectacular confrontation that was dramatically unexpected. Mm. In fact, if you put together the elements of this battle for a piece of fiction or for a movie, right, right no one would well, believe There's one it. coming up, isn't there? There is one coming up very soon, I know. But uh, it's so improbable right. that the outcome was just shocking. It's amazing that about World War II, though, isn't it? Because there's lots of stuff that happens in that incredible conflict where you just think you couldn't make it up. I mean, if you put that in a movie script, no one would believe it, and well, yet it happens. It's true, but Midway in particular, I think, because right. of the way it turns so quickly, so dramatically, in roughly about a seven-minute period, the whole war pivoted. <laughs> isn't that? That's just amazing. Yeah. But let, let, let's rewind. So, okay. Uh, let's rewind just very briefly to Pearl Harbor. And... The, the, this is a kind of preemptive strike to try and knock the Americans out for a period. Right. Is, is that that's basically what Yamamoto, Admiral right. Yamamoto, he's the head of the, the Japanese Navy, and he hatches this plan. He does, he does, and I think a lot of Americans, in particular, don't understand the Japanese never really expected to win this war, as we would think of the word winning. That is, right. they weren't going to land on the American West Coast, march over the Rocky Mountains, and dictate peace in the White House. That was never part of their plan. No. The idea was based on a cultural assumption that they made that the Americans would not have the, the, the stuff to last out a long war. So they would right. knock out the fleet for a six-month period, during which uh, they would conquer the resource base they needed to continue the war in China, which was really the driving force behind all this. Yes, and that's because they're short of resources. Yes. They're, they're rapidly urbanizing. They mm -hmm. haven't got enough natural resources themselves. And right. so they're looking at around the world, and they're thinking, well, Britain's got a big empire. You know, the right. U.S. has got the Philippines and stuff. Yeah, and, well, the Dutch know, in particular, the, the Dutch, East, East Indies were yeah, critical. And, and, the, and the East Indies, yeah, absolutely. And, and they're kind of thinking... Well, you know, hang on. We, we, this is this is how to do it. Yeah. This is how yeah. we replenish our stocks. This is how we get the resources we need. Right. Well, part of it, and I say it's cultural because I think the Japanese made that decision because the options to them seem to be either to kowtow to the Americans to get permission. Oh, please, may we buy your oil and scrap metal and so on, so that we can continue industrializing and thereby continue the war in China or get it on our own. And for them, that's not even a choice. Clearly, right. they're going to get it on their own. But the fear was if they took those resources from the Dutch and the French and the British, all of whom were now, you know, kind of knocked down because of the German war machine, um, that the Americans would intervene. Yep. And that's not necessarily the case. Mm. I mean, I don't know. You know, we look back now and say, would the United States, if the Japanese had bypassed the Philippines yep. and gone after the Dutch East Indies, Malaya and French Indochina, and ignored the Philippines, and would Franklin Roosevelt have been able to convince the American public to go to war to protect God, the empires point, of it? European countries? And that's that's problematic. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. I, well, I've got to say, I'd never thought of that. Prime Minister Kono, you know, offers to withdraw from China and all sorts of stuff, and, and Roosevelt says, mm, no, I don't think so. Well, not, not quite. That, not quite, okay, but put me yeah. right on this. Um, the Americans were making a number of suggestions. The first thing they said was, you've got to get out of Indochina altogether. The yes. Japanese going into Indochina was really the trigger. Yeah, that, that led was to in the 1940, American, isn't it? That's in 1940. And that led the Americans to cut off uh, financial, you know, uh, right. resource to uh, credits that they used to buy American oil. Got they you. didn't really embargo American oil completely, but they did cut off credits that right. allowed them to buy it. So the impact was the same. Yes. And that put the Japanese against the wall. They had to now decide whether to say, oh, yes, sir, please, may we buy your oil or... I'm going to go get my oil on my own. Thank you very much. And I should just say that Indochina is what became Vietnam. Yes, correct. Sorry. Yes, then French right. Indochina at that point. Correct. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, that, so but, but things are kind of starting to escalate, aren't they? Well, what? again, assumptions, cultural assumptions. The Japanese assume, all right, the Americans will intervene because they'll see this as a threat to the Philippines. They'll see this as a way of leveraging Japanese behavior in China and Indochina and elsewhere. And so they will intervene. So... The Americans are stronger than we are, they're more powerful than we are, they're richer than we are, but what they don't have is our ability to stay the tough course. Right. So if we knock out their battle fleet right away, first yep. day, yep. 
then that'll buy Particularly us. the carriers. Well, yes, particularly the carriers, and that's where we're going to get to Midway. Uh, but, of course, the carriers aren't there to be revisited in a minute. Yep. But if we knock out the American battle fleet on day one, that buys us six months to develop this, uh, not only a resource base to get those raw materials, but also a defensive perimeter. Yes. The Americans will try to fight their way through that, but it will take them years. And the Americans being feckless, fat, yeah, commercial, lazy, um, commercial, yeah, yeah, yeah. right, right. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. those Americans. Non-militaristic. They won't be able to stick it out. Because they don't have the discipline that we have. Correct. And therefore, they'll say, oh, well, let's negotiate. And in that negotiation, the Japanese would figure out how to keep most of what they conquered. That's the battle plan. But even so, it's always kind of, you know, even Yamamoto, as I understand it, kind of recognizes it's quite a long shot. It is. But, but they're in a corner. And what, else, what else can you do? It's either kind of complete retreat or fight your way out. Well, there, was, extent, there is that it? third option that we mentioned earlier, which is, you know, ignore the Americans. Yeah. And why is that not... Why is that not considered more seriously they they thought it was too great a risk and which sounds ridiculous considering what a risk, a risk it is of, to attack pearl harbor yeah but they considered it too much a risk to leave the philippines on the line of supply that was bring right. that would be bringing those raw materials to japan really so they th we have no choice we've just got to deal with it we have no choice got to do it the government had virtually been taken over by the military by then anyway yes once tojo becomes prime minister the writing's on the wall the writing's it's, on it's, the wall it's, it's, uh, you're absolutely and it's, right and it's all or nothing yeah Correct. It, but but it is still a kind of roll of the gambler's dice, isn't it? It is. It is. And, and I think everyone's, I mean, it, within Japanese imperial headquarters, they're kind of aware of that, aren't they? I mean, they, they, they think he's got a good chance of, of, of working because otherwise they wouldn't do it. But but they still know that it is that it is coming with quite a lot of risk. Yes. But you or know do you think funny? they're more confident than they... I think one of the things Westerners tend to overlook is how much they were psychologically invested in the war in China. We think right. China as a, you know, a kind of a backwater theater, but 30 million Chinese died in this war. This is the real fighting front for the Japanese. Yeah. They got themselves embroiled in that in 1937, founded a quagmire, couldn't get out, needed the resources to continue right. it. The Americans are twisting their arms saying, get out of China. Yep. They can't do that without losing face. Yep. So to win the war in China... And they, they, and they need China because China's... I mean, the whole point of going to China in the first place is because that's where they're going to get their resources from. Well, yes, and it, that becomes a circular wheel because to get the resources, they have to in, engage in this right. interminable war. And it's starting to cost them rather than gain them. It costs them. Yep. It costs them in, uh, at uh, every level, psychologically, financially, in terms of material reality. Lost man, I guess, as well. Absolutely. Yeah, the whole thing. Yeah. So, that, so, so this plan is to go into Pearl Harbor and knock out the U.S. fleet. Right. But, but high on the list are the aircraft carriers. They, they are, and of course they get there, and the carriers aren't there. Now, this is one of the things that feeds these interminable uh, conspiracy theories you hear about in terms of uh, the Pearl Harbor attack, that somehow the American government knew this was coming, this was a back it's door to get into the... It's nonsense, It's isn't absolute it? nonsense. There's a great line about conspiracy theories, which is that conspiracy theories were designed for um, stupid people to make them feel intellectual. <laughs> I won't touch that, but I, but I like it. Um, but in fact, a long scheduled um, refit for the Saratoga was underway. So the Saratoga is on the west coast of the United States, so it's gone. Yes. The Yorktown has been moved to the Atlantic because of right. the threat of the German U-boats on yes. the North Atlantic convoy. Yeah, so it's forget, not there. Everyone forgets that the you know, U.S. Atlantic fleet is operating in the Battle of the Atlantic Absolutely. At that's time. A, that's an actual war. I mean, we're not, it's not a declared war, but it's no. a no-kidding-shooting war where people are dying. Yeah. Um, and a destroyer gets sunk, yep, the Reuben James. Yep, yes, indeed. So that leaves two carriers in the Pacific. And on the 27th of November, when uh, husband Kimmel gets this war warning from Washington, war could break out at this any is the day. This Admiral, he's the admiral and commander of the U.S. fleet in Pearl yep. Harbor at the time, the guy who takes the fall yes. for being unprepared. Yep. He decides the way to deal with this is to reinforce two outlying American outposts, Midway and Wake. He's got two carriers left. He sends one to each of them with a reinforcement squadron. So they're at sea on the 7th of December. So when the Japanese come into Pearl Harbor, there are no carriers there. What is interesting, I think, is, is that in the minds of most people, by 1941, it is still battleships that count. I mean, for, for kind of 40 years, battleships have been king. And, and, and they're a kind of projection of naval power. They're enormous. They've got huge guns and all the rest right. of it. But actually, a shift has taken place already, hasn't it? A shift has already taken place. It's just not everybody has bought into it yet or appreciates it yet. Midway is going to play a major role in determining 
in, in, in proving that that shift has already happened. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and so it is a major disaster for the Japanese that those aircraft carriers aren't at Pearl Harbor. Oh, it is. And However Yama- catastrophic Pearl Harbor clearly is. Well, Yamamoto knows this. I mean, on the one hand, he gets this report from Nagumo, who commanded the, the carrier force that attacked Pearl yeah. Harbor, that terrific success, sunk four battleships, damaged four others, the entire American Pacific fleet is knocked out, but no carriers. Well, Yamamoto is terribly disappointed. He knows that the carriers, even though he was a battleship guy himself, he knows the carriers are the key, and he's desperate to get those carriers, and that is what informs the creation of the plan to go after Midway. Right. Because Midway was the bait. Midway isn't a target. No. Midway is the bait. Right. The idea is attack, threaten Midway. That'll be serious enough that the Americans will send their carriers out. And when they do, the Japanese will pounce on them and send them to the bottom. That is the whole idea behind the Midway battle plan. But, but, but Midway is six months and a bit on from, you know, the, uh, Pearl Harbor is obviously early December 1941. Um, Midway is June right. 1942. So what's, what's going on in the Pacific between, in those six months? Well, first of all, the Japanese are consolidating their resource base. They're right. taking the Dutch East. Java, Sumatra, Borneo, mm-hmm. Malaya, the Philippines, all of that is going on. That That's a major campaign. They absolutely yep. annihilate what's called the ABDA command, yes, American, yes. British, Dutch, Australian. Uh, the, the Allies cobble all their forces together. Still not enough. They're yep. annihilated in the Battle of the Java Sea and Sunda yep, Strait. Yep. So what's happening is the Japanese are doing exactly what they plan to do. They are gaining this resource base, creating their defensive perimeter. There is the Battle of the Coral Sea. Yes, the Battle the, of the 8th Cor- of May? Yes, the Battle of the Coral Sea, 8th and 9th. The Battle of the Coral Sea is the thing that for the first time, the Japanese failed to achieve an objective. They wanted to capture Port Moresby. Yes. Uh, the battle itself is kind of a drawn confrontation. The and Port Moresby lose. is in uh, New Guinea. In the southern coast of New Guinea. And the yeah. Japanese wanted to take it to complete their defensive barrier. And this is, the whole idea is this, this, this islands that run off the kind of the north and, and north west of Australia, Correct. and that, that, that's, bl- that's a blocking line, effectively, right. between Australia and the Pacific yeah. coast of the United if, States. If you Hawaii. look at a map, uh, and you can trace kind of a semicircle down from um, the Malay Peninsula, yes. all the way through those major islands, yes. Sumatra and Java, and on the way out, it makes kind of an arc, a shield, if yes. you would, the way the Japanese thought of it. So have that shield... And that protects you. Correct. And that's your block, and it right. also, and it, but it also separates Australia. Yes, right. Which right. is obviously a major launch base right. for right. Australians, but also for the British, you know, for the Allies. Right. To stop. The Japanese assumption is when the Americans try a counterattack, it won't work, of course. But when they try it, they will base it out of Australia. So to isolate Australia is a key goal. Got you. So, so Coral Sea is, and it. That's always kind of said to be the first carrier battle. Is, it is. That is, that is the case. It is. It is. It's the first naval battle where the opposing fleets never see one another. So all the confrontation takes place by carrier-launched airplanes. Yeah, and boy, I mean, you know, let's just, just pause for a minute and talk about, you know, what it's like being a, a naval aviator because mm. that's a tough job, isn't it? Oh, you think about that. I mean, even today, maybe even more today when you're firing... Uh, Firing. Listen to the word, the verb I just used to to fire a, a jet off a carrier deck. I mean, those things are launched from zero to yeah. you know 100 knots in about 200 feet. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't quite that uh, dramatic in 1942, but it was pretty dramatic. Um, I know. I'm, I suppose I'm thinking. You know, I, I'm a Spitfire pilot in 1940, and you know, I do I have a hard hard day of, of, of fighting the Hun in the sky over Kent. Um, but in the evening, I can go land back down on a lovely grass airfield, and I can <laughs> I can go to the pub and have a few pints with my mates. Yeah. And you know, and everyone tells me what a hero I am, and yeah. you know, you feel quite good about yourself. But if you're a naval carrier pilot, whether you be Japanese or American, you know, you've got to land on something that's moving in the middle of an ocean, where if you get it wrong, you're toast. That's and, true. And that's, that's true. Uh, and you're in a cramped conditions of a ship, right? Which is never quite as luxurious as it might be because it's a war vessel uh, you know just working on those planes is pretty hard work i mean yeah. it, it is hardcore it is and, but on the other hand for both sides so but it is even if you never see an enemy taking off from and landing on a moving carrier deck as you say is an inherently dangerous activity and, and the japanese do you know from an a, uh, from an aviation point of view they've got some aces because the zero in 1941 and early 1942 is still a very very good plane right and those those pilots are super well trained, aren't they? They are. You the, know, 500 the, hours before they go yes. to a squadron? The Japanese had a, a qualitative advantage in 1942. In the first six months of 1942 in particular, the Americans, the dive bomber is the only one of their airplanes. All, well, let me back up. 
all carriers carry three kinds of airplanes. Right. A dive bomber, which yep. for the Americans became the principal offensive target. A torpedo bomber, which for the Japanese was the principal offensive target because their torpedoes actually worked. <laughs> and a fighter plane to provide cover and protection yes. for the task force and protection for the strike force as it went out to attack the enemy. Right. So you have these three kinds. And of those three, the Japanese had superior fighter planes and superior torpedo planes and, as you say, better pilots. I mean, 500 hours they're getting in before they right. were sent. And they also, you know, that, that kind of... Uh, incredibly rigorous discipline, almost kind of sort of sadistic kind of treatment that they get in training. You know, wh whether you're a naval guy, whether you're a, Very a, much an aviator, so. whether you're a soldier, that's part of the well, kind of here's a cultural the Japanese difference. way, isn't it? He, it is, and, and here's a cultural difference between the two sides, one of several, and that is that the Japanese pilot training program was designed to wash out the inefficient. The American pilot training program was designed to embrace the marginal and teach them how to become better pilots. So the Japanese had better, conscientiously trained, fiercely trained, as you suggest, yes pilots but they didn't have that many of them right and, and in this six months which looks like an unalloyed japanese triumph after triumph they are losing pilots as they go yeah and they which don't you always go replace to them yeah. right because yeah. you because the training program is too big it's right. too, too long right. and they just don't have the time to replace Correct. them i mean and you're absolutely right about the u.s i mean you think about gabby gabreski who's who's a fighter pilot makes his name obviously over in um, over in the uk with the mighty eighth but on pearl harbor on that day i mean he nearly flunks out twice and yeah. he has to do a kind of you know right. he has to do one of those tests right. where they kind of right this is your final chance and he's just a bit useless and he becomes a kind of one of the greatest yeah. aces ever i mean it's amazing yeah. well one of the one of the examples is that a, a japanese a pilot trainer who flunked out half the people he was training would be applauded for having high standards an american trainer who flunked out half of his would be cashiered for being an ineffective teacher yeah, right right it's amazing isn't it so these it's just a cultural thing yeah yeah. So Coral Sea, that's, that's a kind of, what is that, a draw? Well, we, we often say it's a tactical draw because the Americans lose one of their major fleet carriers. That's a big loss. Mm -hmm. And a fleet oiler, which were scarce at the time, so that's a real loss as well, and a destroyer. The Japanese lose a small carrier, which goes to the bottom, and severe damage to one of their fleet carriers. So if you measure that off, and particularly if you count up the airplanes and the pilots and so on, uh, it looks pretty even-handed. But the difference is it's a strategic victory for the Americans right. because the Japanese turn around and go back. And if you look at maps today of the furthest extent of Japanese conquests, that line stops just short of Port Moresby. Wow. Okay. So then, so there's a month between Coral Sea and Midway. And what, right. what is happening in that month? There's also, there's tensions emerging, aren't there, between the Imperial Army and the Imperial Navy about, about strategy. Because oh. the, the Army want to go into <laughs> Ceylon, don't they, and then use that as a springboard for the invasion of India. Well, yeah, the, Yamamoto's arguing for a kind of naval first policy. There, there is tension and uh, argument between the army and the navy in almost any nation's environment. But okay. it's hard to overestimate how ferocious the army-navy rivalry was in Japan. Right. They are not only separate services, they're almost separate governments who happen to be on the same side. <laughs> yeah. It's ferocious. And, and the army is dominant. Tojo has now become prime minister, mm -hmm. army general. Uh, and Yamamoto, who's the Navy commander, uh, has things that he wants to accomplish. And getting the army to go along is very difficult. Yep. He wants to attack Midway as bait to draw out the American carriers and finish the job that was started but incomplete at Pearl Harbor. The army says, we want no part of that. We just, we were already overextended. We're yep. not going to send a division out to occupy this crummy, sandy islet in the middle of the Pacific yep. Ocean. We're not going to do it. And then the Doolittle Raid happens. The Doolittle Raid, the bombing of, in April of 1942, the Doolittle Raid, these army bombers launched off a Navy carrier, bomb four Japanese cities, including Tokyo. That puts, technically at least, the emperor's life at risk. The army now decides, well, maybe we'll get involved in this after all. Because so, in terms of damage, it's not massive. The damage is... But psychologically. It's psychological entirely. And it's not that, I want to make this very clear, it's not that the Doolittle Raid triggers the Midway expedition. That had already been decided on. Midway is going to happen Right. with or without Doolittle. But what it does do is convince the army that they want to be in on this too. Right. Okay, so that is, that's, a, that's a key point. So, so what, what are these? So tell me, first of all, just tell me a little bit about Yamamoto, because he's a very interesting guy, isn't he? He is a fascinating guy. I mean, he had done two tours in the United States, so he knew a lot, of, a lot about the American industrial capability. And that's one of the reasons why he was uh, pumping the brakes 
on this catastrophic decision to attack uh, the United States at all. But then once it was clear that that was going to happen, with or without his o approval, he says, well, all right, if we're going to do this, the only chance we have is this idea of knocking out the fleet on the first right. day, consolidating in defensive perimeter, and then defying the Americans. We can absolutely run wild. A famous quotation of his, I can run wild for six months after that, I have no idea. So he knows that it's going to be a long, tough slog. Uh, but he's he's a brilliant tactician, uh, a brilliant gamesman. He, he's a risk taker, yep. uh, very intellectual. Is he? Uh, so he's he's a cultured intellectual man. Oh, he's, very much so. Yeah, wrote haikus. Uh, I mean, is, is he the kind of person you'd have liked to have had dinner with? Oh, I think he would have been fascinating to have dinner with. And Absolutely. you think he'd have been courteous and 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 oh, and without a doubt, and, without a doubt, he would have been. Um, I mean, he is the, he is the kind of one. Him and I suppose Yamashita are the kind of the, the, the two Japanese commanders that, that kind of just seem to kind of they don't seem quite as sort of brutal and I think tough they could I think of, they in the particular others. could see beyond the horizon right. of their own culture's assumptions. Yeah. Because it is quite a myopic, myopic worldview, isn't it? Well, we're it? all that way. I don't want to pin this entirely on the Japanese. We all see the world through our own cultural blinders. Yeah. Uh, this happened to be catastrophic catastrophic for the Japanese because they affected their behavior but I think we're all guilty of that yeah I guess so I, I suppose I just always felt I've always felt that, that one of the advantages the allies have is that they have you know Roosevelt and Churchill they have two leaders who have a kind of geopolitical understanding which is better than those of their enemies yeah, leaders. that's that's I think that's absolutely right so back to Midway yeah so the, the plan is to, is to lure the Americans into this trap, and he splits his forces, doesn't he? Well, Yamamoto. and this is, a, this is a Japanese trait, again, to be too clever by half. The Japanese in June of 1942 have not overwhelming, but clearly significant superiority in terms of the number of carriers, available battleships, obviously, but also heavy cruisers, and in almost every other measurable index of military power at sea. They don't need to be clever. They don't need to use an American football analogy. They don't need to do a double reverse halfback pass option. They can just, just go right up the middle. Yeah. Um, but they choose not to do that. So they divide their forces into about five different operational groups. And it makes sense if you assume the Americans will be surprised by this. And this is where we're going to come back to another topic in a minute, I'm sure. But you station your submarines, you see, off of Oahu, which is where Pearl Harbor is, so that when the American carriers come out, they can be ambushed first by the submarines. Right. You draw those carriers out by attacking Midway, which will be the first time the Americans realize the Japanese are there. And then they will be pounced on by the submarines and then by the carrier airplanes and then finally by the battleships, each operating in separate group. And, of course, there's also a landing force. which right. will do. So all of these separate groups are operating at a distance far apart from one another that makes it difficult to cooperate. So, so what, I mean, what sort of distance are we talking about? Are we talking 50 miles, 100 miles? Hundreds of miles. Wow. Okay, yeah. that, that is a Beyond long... the range of operational aircraft. What, okay, yeah, that really is a long way yeah. away, isn't it? Yeah. And so then what happened? Well, before we say what happens, the, the missing element here is, is the intelligence. Is intelligence. That's a key. Now, I, I, wanna, I don't want to overestimate this because what happened is the role that intelligence and code breaking played in the Battle of Midway was classified for 70 years. Right. Uh, then when it became... Uh, uh, declassified in the early 1970s, the assumption was, oh, well, that explains everything. <laughs> now, we knew exactly where they were going to be. We knew everything about it. Well, that's an exaggeration the other way. Yeah. Here's the middle ground that is true. The Americans were able to read just enough right. of the Japanese operational code, a word here, a phrase there, a, a number someplace else, and put it together with hard slogging work um, in order to come up with a guesstimate, an estimate of what the Japanese were likely to do. And that information went to the American Pacific Fleet Commander, Admiral Chester Nimitz, yep. who had to make the decision, well, what am I going to do about this? Right. Here's what I'm told. It's uh, Lieutenant Commander Joseph Rochefort, who was the guy running this secret crypt analytic operation yep. in Oahu, tells him, well, we're pretty sure the Japanese are going to attack Midway. They're going to do it in the first week of June. They're going to do it with four or five aircraft carriers plus supporting ships. That's what we think we know. 
And Nimitz's job is to decide what to do about that. That's the burden of command, isn't it? The, it is. The higher, the higher you up, go up the chain, the fewer big decisions you have to make, but those decisions you do have to make are massive. Massive. Uh, and keep in mind that the overall strategic goal of the Allies, the British and the Americans together, is that Germany is the primary enemy. So yes. it's Germany first. Yes. So one but option. But that doesn't mean that doesn't mean the ignoring the Japanese. But it does mean that you're not going to take forces out of the Atlantic to support. The idea is focuses on the Atlantic mm -hmm. and will hold on the defensive in the Pacific. Well, if that's the case. Holding on the defensive here, what does that mean? Does it mean defending Midway? If you're going to defend Midway, that's defensive. And it is the best form of defense attack. But on the other hand, here come four or five carriers, and you've only got three, and in a way you've only got two and a half, mm. because you lost the Lexington in the Battle of Coral Sea, yep. and the Yorktown has been badly wounded. So the only two fully operational carriers you have were the two that were used to bomb Tokyo in this Doolittle raid. Right. That's it. So you've yep. got those two, and the Yorktown, if you can patch <coughs> it up quickly, so maybe you could come up with three, but here's the way Nimitz thinks about it. All right, the Japanese are coming with four, maybe five carriers. We've got three, and the island of Midway which has an airfield. That's like a carrier. I mean, yeah. it can't maneuver, but it can't sink. Yep. So we load that up with airplanes, whatever we can get our hands on, an eclectic group of Marine, Army, Navy planes, whatever we've got, and we treat that as a as a as one of our as a platform. Players. And that's four on four. So that's and we know they're coming. Yep. So I'm going for it. Yep. But that it's hard now to look back and realize what a bold decision that was. Yeah. And Nimitz is great, isn't he? Oh, I, yes. I mean, he's he's tops. I mean, the, there are some incredible commanders in the Second World War, and I think on the whole, Allied commanders get less of a good press than they deserve. But but in the Pacific, there's, I mean, you know, Bill Halsey and well, Nimitz. These, I think, these are yeah, and I think one of the reasons the tree, that they? Nimitz is overlooked is because he's not flashy. He's that yeah, very right. quiet. Yep. Uh, he's the kind of guy who can get along with allies because he is quiet. He yeah. he negotiates. He's not a show pony. He's not a show pony. He's not Bill Halsey. He's not Patton. He's more like Eisenhower than Patton, for example. Right. If you use right. the European theater as an example, mm -hmm. and so I think I think Nimitz is a model of the way you want a theater commander to behave. Statesmanlike, able to take the big hits, right? Able right. to take the big decisions, right. measured, right? All those and things. yet willing to take the bold. Yep. decision and accept the responsibility yep. for it. Yep. Yep. So he decides he's going to send these carriers out. The two carriers come back from the Tokyo raid and Bill Halsey, who would have commanded the carriers, shows up to report and he's just, he's a wreck of a man. He's got skin rashes all over mm -hmm. his body, he's exhausted, his big bags under his eyes, he can barely stand right. up to give his report and Nimitz orders him into the hospital. He says, you, you cannot right. do this. He says, but I'm going to send your ships out to fight what may be the most important battle of the war. Sorry, Bill. Um, who do you pick to take your place and command your two carriers? And he says, well, my, my uh, carrier, my cruiser screen commander, Ray Spruance. That's the guy. Well, the problem is Spruance is not a carrier guy. He doesn't wear the wings of an aviator, as Halsey does. Never commanded a carrier before, much less a carrier group. But here he goes with about one day's notice to take these two carriers out and take on the uh, the Japanese main carrier force in the what may be the decisive battle of the Pacific War. It is amazing, isn't it? it? In it terms is. of kind of sort of human drama, you just and again, this goes back to what we said it, at the you? outset. If you know, if you if you made up these characters for a novel, your editor would say, "No, I'm sorry, nobody's going to buy this. Yeah, it's, it's just it's too just, unlikely." It's amazing. Yeah. So anyway, so so Spruance take, takes it. He, he he's. Got the job, and off he goes. Yeah. Well, remember, Spruance is not an overall command. He's in command of those two carriers. Yes. The, the Yorktown, which is the third American carrier, is commanded by another, what were called black shoes, that is, battleship commanders, a guy named Frank Jack Fletcher. Great American yes. name. Yeah. Frank Jack. Frank Jack Fletcher is actually senior to Hall. So he's the officer in tactical command of right. the American group. But they're operating in two separate groups. Right. Right? Two carriers under Spruance, one carrier under Fletcher, but with Fletcher in overall command. And how, how good are comms between those two carrier groups? Well, they want to maintain radio silence. So as long as they're within visual range of one another, they can communicate by blinker. Right. Uh, or flag hoist, but blinker most of the time, mm -hmm. or what's called uh, the short-range radio, talk between ships, TBS. Right. Right. But you can't send 
radio messages out or the Japanese will intercept them and know that there's a carrier right. force at sea. So they're operating under radio silence. They yes. can receive messages, but they can't send them. Right. So here they are out waiting in their ambush position, and Nimitz can send them updates. Here's what we found, here's a sighting report and so right. on, but right. they can't send out any messages. Right, so you receive but not send. Correct. So off they go. Off they go. And they're up there, and they name this this rendezvous point Point Lock. And because they go out several days ahead of the expected arrival of the Japanese, when the Japanese submarine cordon gets into place, they think, oh, we're going to ambush the American carriers when they come out. They're already gone. They've already gone right. north of Midway, so the submarines are waiting there. So they're they're wasted, right? right. So, so they they pay no for the no no role at all. Now, the American subs do. The American subs are out patrolling, looking for the Japanese, and we can talk about that later. But the, the main thing is the Japanese are going to come and attack Midway with an airstrike. They think this is going to be the first time the Americans hear about this because they don't know about the code breaking, right? So they think the Americans will first hear about their arrival when they attack Midway. Mm -hmm. And they get to Midway, and there's no airplanes on the airfield. They're already up. They're already up. Heading towards the... Heading toward the Japanese carriers. That's right. Amazing. Amazing. So, the Americans arrive over the Japanese carriers at about the time the Japanese are bombing Midway. Mm. But the Japanese take care of those carriers with ease. We talked earlier about how effective the Japanese pilots were. They shoot these guys down like it's, you know, a duck hunt. It's easy. Wow. Yeah. They send out a total of, I've forgotten what it is, 60, 70, 80 planes in different groups. Because they're different groups and they have different air speeds, they arrive at different times, yep. and the Japanese can just pick them off. It's easy pickings. And the Americans miss everything. The torpedoes don't particularly work to begin right. with. The bombs all miss. Now, So what, early doors, it's not looking great. Oh, the Japanese are winning. They've just swatted down all these Americans. Now... The high-flying American B-17s, the so-called Flying Fortress Bombers, that the Army operates, they're flying from 20,000 feet. Yeah. So they drop these bombs and they see these big explosions down on the surface. Near. I mean, it's almost impossible to hit. But they come back and report, we sank three carriers. No. Yes. Right. So the Army says, oh, we did it. We did it. We won. We yep. won the battle. So they don't, the Americans don't really know, right? And, uh, of course, the American carriers are still out north of Midway, listening in on the radio traffic without really knowing what's going on. But they launch once the location of the Japanese has been determined. Uh, exactly where they are north of Midway, they've launched the planes, we know where they are, okay, we'll launch their planes. So the Americans launch from the carriers before the Japanese know the carriers are even out there. Yeah. So then what happens? Well... What happens then is that the, uh, the Americans flying from the carriers toward the Japanese get separated. And there are a variety of reasons for this. Um, I'm gonna, there's a very controversial aspect of the Battle of Midway. It's called the Flight to Nowhere. <laughs> <clears throat> and it's based on what happens to the air group from the carrier Hornet. Right. Um, the captain of the Hornet is a guy named Mark Mitcher, whose nickname is Pete. And Pete Mitcher was an old pilot from way back, a grizzled-looking old Navy veteran who's, <laughs> who thinks he knows best how to use uh, airplanes. Because remember, the two people senior to him, Fletcher and Spruance, are not pilots. Right. And he is. And he, the Hornets launched the Doolittle Raid. And it's from the Hornets that they launch a Doolittle Raid. So he knows what he's doing. Right. And as he looks at the intelligence reports, he sees that two carriers, two Japanese carriers, have been sighted at this location. But two have not been sighted. Somewhere are two more. He knows that. And the intelligence estimates suggest that they may be operating some 80, maybe 100 miles behind the other two. And he says, and I'm going to go get those carriers. So he sends his air group out to the west to right. find those two carriers. But in fact, all four Japanese carriers are operating together, and the, the observation planes simply didn't see them. So the entire Hornet air group is wasted. Is wasted. So instead of being three on four, it's now two on four. So that's part of the problem. It's a Hornet air group, is, they're off the board, right? right. Well, the Enterprise also launched early that morning, and those planes head for those coordinates, and they get to the coordinates, and there's nothing there. Because the Japanese, as soon as they find out the Americans are nearby, they turn around and go north. And having missed that report, 
they arrive and look at the ocean. It's empty. Oh, what do we do now? Well, now, God, at I mean, this you moment... You see how it happens, because oh, the ocean yeah. is such a big place. Yeah, and the Japanese have shot down everything from Midway, and the Hornet group's gone the wrong way, and the Enterprise group can't find them. The Japanese are chuckling. Yep. Well, the guy in command of the bombing group from the Enterprise is a fellow named Clarence McCluskey, who goes by his middle name, Wade. And Wade McCluskey is, is an old fighter pilot, but he's now in command of the bombing squadron. So he says, I'm, I'm just going to look for him. Even though he's already used up more than half of his gas, he says, I'm not going back until I find him. So he starts circling and circling, and he spots one Japanese destroyer all by itself. But it's speeding north at about 35 knots, and it's leaving behind a white wake on the surface of the water. And he thinks to himself, why would a Japanese destroyer be out here all by itself? It's a laggard. It's gone to catch up with the main body. I'm going to go that way. Right. And he does go that way. And about 10.22 that morning, his He's bombing awesome. squadron finds the Japanese carriers. And they turn in for the hit. They do. And here's why it works. Because the torpedo squadrons, which are slower and had been separated from the bombing squadron, have found the carriers sooner. They flew a truer course than the bombers did, found the uh, Japanese carriers. Yep. The, the one that arrives first, curiously, is the one from the Hornet that right. broke off from the right. flight to nowhere by itself, by a guy, Jack Waldron, who commanded that group. He says, ah, you don't know where you're going. You're wrong, and turns off, essentially committing mutiny in the middle of a battle in order to find the carriers, but he did arrives with his 15 planes. They're all 15 shot down. Then wow. come the, the torpedo squadrons from the other two American carriers, and they're all shot down. Only four get back to the American carriers out That's of 20-some airplanes, wow. torpedo so planes launched that slaughter. morning. But here's, here's the contribution they make inadvertently. This was not a plan, but it worked out anyway. The Japanese Zeros flying combat air patrol over the carriers to protect them right. see these torpedo planes coming in at about 100, 150 feet because they have to fly in low to launch those torpedoes. Of so they come screaming down from 15,000 feet to shoot down all these American planes. So they're down at 200 feet when McCluskey arrives with his bombers at 1020 that morning right. at 20,000 so feet. The air is clear. So they can line up, take their time, pick their targets, go into the dive. Hit the money. And hit the money. And so it, that's why it's possible to say at 1022 that morning, the Japanese were winning the Battle of Midway. They were winning the war in the Pacific. And at 1030. At 1030, they were losing. Oh, that's amazing, isn't it? Because those bombs hit three of the four Japanese carriers, the Kaga, the Akagi and the Soryu are all burning and sinking within five minutes. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's, again, back to, you know, if you made this up for a movie, which is coming yeah. out. I don't mean to plug the movie, but uh, it, it's, a, it's an astonishing sequence of events. And, and I, let me make this point. Uh, some of the early, really great books about this by Walter Lord and Gordon Prang mm -hmm. often refer to what an amazing sequence of luck determine the outcome. And I push back a little bit against that. Yep. There's luck in every battle. But here I think it's the decisions that are made by the operators on the scene. I mean, you could start with Nagumo's decision uh, to attack Midway first, and then his decision to recover that returning attack and rearm it before he sent out a strike against the American carriers. That bought the Americans the time they needed to yep. get there. So that's one. Uh, Nimitz's decision yep. to pick up the gauntlet that the Japanese had thrown down to send those three carriers yep. out to Point Luck. Yeah, it's not a question of luck, is it? It's a decision. Well, luck is always part of it. But And then Wade McCluskey's decision right. to search for that. I mean, all of these are part of the puzzle that makes it up. Right. So it, it does seem almost makes you believe in providence right. to see right. the outcome of this. But, but it really does go back to individual decisions made by people on the scene about how they're going to react. Right. Yeah, I, it's, it's an absolutely extraordinary story. Uh, and immediately after Midway, you've then got, you know, a month later, you've got Guadalcanal starting and yes, another series of naval battles, because we always think of Guadalcanal being this island and therefore a land operation, but it isn't. It's air, land and sea, isn't it? It is, that's, absolutely. That, that's the kind absolutely. Of point and of course, you, you seize the... the uh, American Marines who sees that little tiny bit of the northern coast of Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal is a big island. It's not yes. like a little 
you know, a single palm tree and all this stuff. Yeah, it's a no, big, I've been, I've been jungly, I've, I've, mountainous I've, I've island. It. It's, um, and, it's an amazing. Uh, yes, it is. And, and the Americans see this little tiny piece of it, but they could not have held that without the sea lift capability. They could not have defended it no, if they hadn't completed not. the airfield and had the Cactus Air Force to support right. them ashore. So. So, so it is an air, sea, land campaign, and, yeah. and some incredible but, naval battles take place in that war, in those waters. But let me back up to why the Americans go into Guadalcanal in the first place. I mean, right. Ernie King, who is the American chief of naval operations, uh, has from the beginning wanted to push back against the Japanese in the Pacific as soon as possible. The overall Allied strategy of Germany first kind of sticks in his craw. That's yes, not his yes, favorite yes. thing. No. So, so he doesn't want to sacrifice the idea that we can be on the offensive in the Pacific. And Midway is what gives him, in a way, that opportunity. Right. Uh, the American victory at Midway creates the opportunity for him to say, all right, now we can begin to make the Japanese react to us instead of our reacting Got to it. them. Got it. And the other thing, of course, is, is suddenly industrial might is starting to kick in, isn't it? Because, because the loss of those aircraft carriers for the Japanese, you know, that's something they're they're not going to be replacing those anytime soon. Right. We, Whereas, we, didn't, we didn't mention, by the way, that the fourth of those Japanese carriers is sunk later that afternoon in, yes. in a second so American all, strike. So all, all four, four, which is why early on I compared it to Trafalgar, the yes. absolute annihilation of the enemy main battle fleet yeah. with the sinking of all four of their frontline carriers yeah. in, in a... And these are fleet in carriers. In a single day. And, yes. and it's worth pointing out that a fleet carrier is different to just an ordinary, you know, you have small little piddly carriers and you have <laughs> no, piddly, but you know what I mean. But I do you, know but, what but you mean. A, but a fleet carrier I think they would these. object to being called piddly, but yeah. I do know what you mean, yes. But, you know, I, and, but, but the main carriers, right. they, these are big boys. Not easily replaced. They, they're your key asset. Absolutely. The Japanese have two others that they've held back yes. from Midway because they had been in the Battle of the Coral Sea. So they have those two and a couple of other mid-range carriers. But by and large, their, their main striking force, what they call the Kido Butai, which yes, is roughly yes. the, the mobile striking force, is all but eliminated from yep. the strategic map. So from this moment on... The Japanese who had been initiating everything, they decided where a battle would be fought. Right. They decided what the target would on be. The back foot. Now it's the other way around. And so how many and how many aircraft carriers are being constructed in shipyards oh, in America at this well, time? Well, and again, American industrial productivity, as you suggested, is absolutely the key element of this war, not only in the Pacific, but worldwide. Uh, because in 1940, Congress passed, without a single dissenting vote, 316 to nothing. I always emphasize that because, of course, Congress today couldn't couldn't pass a, a, anything in, in something in, in favor of motherhood right. uh, by by 316 to nothing. But they they vote this enormous construction of 18 fleet carriers plus seven battleships, 130 it's destroyers. I mean, it's I, I, it's I mean, I'm completely obsessed with the development of um, the American war machine. I, I, I find it so. Unbelievably interesting because in September 1939, America just—I mean, got an okay naval yeah. navy fleet, but, right. but but basically, it's so languishing. 19th largest army in the world behind Portugal, you know, 72 <laughs> fighter planes, almost no right. tanks, right. cavalry which is still on horseback. You know, I mean, it is tiny, and yet, you know, Ground Zero is is sort of the summer of 1940 with the defeat of France right. for, for Britain and for America, and it's okay. We've got to do something about this. And the way Roosevelt manipulates Washington to his bidding and gets the historic third term so that by December 1941, the arsenal of democracy has emerged is just well, one of the most amazing stories. It hasn't quite emerged yet. No, but all it's the emerged. pieces are in the pipeline. Pieces are together. Yeah, that, that's really going to appear on the battlefront in 1943. 1942. Isn't, it? But, but isn't that amazing to go from, from nothing to from to, nothing that to the in, biggest in navy three in years. history? It's well, here's an analogy brutal. I like to make, and not an analogy, but a comparison. That at Midway, the Americans had to cobble together everything they could get their hands on. They had to patch up the Yorktown with right. with scotch tape and bailing wire yeah. so to get three carriers for this decisive battle. Yeah. All right, two years later, in June of 1944, two years later, 24 months, they attacked Saipan with something like 24 aircraft carriers. I mean, that's just, how is that even possible? That's right? amazing, isn't it? Is it is amazing. Great. We, we, um, I've got to go. You've got to go. Um, but thank you. That's been just totally brilliant.
Rob, I've loved you're it. Very I've loved James. that chat and um, and fascinating. And, um, and I really da- love I'm your da- stuff. I appreciate being on. Oh no, no, it's, a, it's, it's great to have you on. And um, yeah, we're kind of all looking forward to uh, the film, uh, but probably going to be disappointed, aren't we? Let's face it. Well, I, I'm sure the the graphics will be dramatic. <laughs> I, I did see a trailer of it. Lots of things blow up. I'll put it that way. <laughs> <laughs>